On paper, they were the kind of warplanes that make your pulse jump. Sleek lines, big ideas, numbers that promised a whole new era. Faster climbs, higher ceilings, more speed in miles per hour than yesterday's aces could even imagine. But war doesn't reward brilliance on a drafting table. It rewards what can launch today, land safely, and launch again tomorrow. This list isn't about bad airplanes. It's about machines that were too advanced for the world that had to keep them running. Engines that wanted perfect fuel, airframes that needed special care, systems that demanded the right tools, the right parts, and the right hands. And when uptime collapses, even genius becomes a hangar ornament. Because sometimes the enemy wasn't in the sky. Sometimes it was on the ground, inside a supply crate that never arrived. Messerschmitt ME-262 On day one, the ME-262 hit the war like a cold splash of water. It was the first operational jet fighter, and its speed, well over 500 miles per hour in the right conditions, changed the geometry of the fight. The approach was a blur, the pass was over before piston fighters could even settle in, and those four 30mm cannons were built for one job, breaking up heavy bombers fast. More than a weapon, it was a platform, the first real step into the jet age. But the ME-262 also showed the price of being early. Its Jumo turbojets demanded materials and manufacturing precision Germany couldn't reliably provide late in the war, so engine life could be short and inconsistent. It was sensitive to throttle handling, vulnerable to runway debris, FOD, and it needed maintenance done by the book, with the right tools and trained hands. It also wanted proper runways and careful ground handling, exactly what collapsing airfields and supply lines couldn't guarantee. The telltale sign? Blazing speed but weak uptime. Breakdowns, overhauls, and missing spare engines turned advantage into brief, expensive moments. Heinkel HE-162 The HE-162 was a jet born from panic and from a kind of grim creativity. Germany's people's fighter idea was brutally simple. Strip the concept down, make it light, make it fast, and build it quickly. On paper, it made sense. A compact little airframe, small enough to hide, easy to scatter across dispersed factories, and fast enough, thanks to jet thrust, to threaten anything still stuck in the propeller age. In theory, it was the shortcut to a new air force. But shortcuts have a cost, and the HE-162 paid it in maturity. The program moved so fast that development time, the slow, boring work that turns a prototype into a dependable weapon, got squeezed hard. Materials and methods were often improvised, with significant use of wood structures and adhesives, which meant quality could swing with glue batches, workmanship, and even humidity and temperature. Then there was the jet engine itself. Early turbojets weren't set it and forget it. They demanded careful procedures, trained mechanics, and steady support. That's the tell. The HE-162 didn't fail for lack of courage or imagination. It struggled because the ground crews, the processes, and the supply chain never had time to learn how to raise a young jet. Messerschmitt ME-163 Comet In 1944, the ME-163 looked like something from the future that had accidentally landed in the middle of World War II. As a rocket-powered interceptor, it could climb and accelerate with a violence that made piston fighters, and even early jets, feel slow by comparison. The concept was razor-sharp. Get to the bomber stream now, slice through it in a blink, and be gone before anyone could react. On paper, it was the ultimate fast answer to high-altitude raids. But the comet's brilliance came wrapped in an operating system that demanded perfection. Its propellant and rocket systems required specialized ground equipment, 
strict rules, and careful handling standards. More like servicing a laboratory experiment than turning around a frontline fighter. And because powered endurance was so short, small mistakes didn't just hurt performance, they erased options. There was no long cruise phase to troubleshoot, no time to nurse it home. When something wasn't right, it stayed wrong. Then came the airframe realities. The comet's landing profile and recovery needs made post-flight handling and turnaround unusually complicated. That's why it lost in the way this list means it. Brilliant for a few minutes, but hard to sustain for weeks. Sortie rate and readiness were squeezed by the very way the aircraft had to be operated. Dornier DO-335 file. The DO-335 was one of those designs that makes engineers grin. Instead of two engines hanging out on the wings like a typical twin, Dornier put them in a push-pull line, one pulling in front, one pushing in back. That meant far less asymmetric thrust drama when something went wrong, and it let the airframe chase speed with a kind of clean confidence. In the right conditions, the file wasn't just quick for a twin. It was shockingly fast, stable, and promising. You can see why people imagined it as everything from a heavy fighter to a fast bomber to a strike platform that could hit and vanish before defenders could react. But the price of that clever layout showed up on the ground. The rear engine installation, cooling, drivetrain details, and simply getting to it for service was more complex than living with a single-engine fighter. The DO-335 also carried labor-expensive systems, safety and escape considerations, landing gear, and control arrangements that demanded skilled hands and correct parts. And by late war, Germany's reality was a wrecked supply chain. Bombed factories, disrupted shipments, uneven quality. The more complicated the airplane, the hungrier it became. That's the signature lost pattern. Maintenance access decides the aircraft's life. Yes, it was fast, but slow turnaround plus missing spares meant it could never build the steady frontline rhythm that wins wars. Heinkel HE-177. The HE-177 was Germany reaching for a heavyweight answer with a sprinter's attitude. The idea was bold. A fast, heavy bomber with long range and big payload. One aircraft that could do it all when the war demanded more reach and more punch. On paper, the power was there. And for a bomber of its class, the promised speed looked genuinely competitive. It was meant to be the kind of machine that could strike hard and still have a chance to outrun trouble on the way home. But the HE-177's signature choice also became its trap. Coupled engines and the complex drivetrain arrangements that went with them. That kind of packaging concentrates heat, multiplies vibration issues, complicates plumbing, and turns routine access into a wrestling match for mechanics. When one part of the system acted up, it didn't just reduce performance, it dragged the entire aircraft down, and downtime climbed fast. You weren't maintaining an engine. You were maintaining a tightly packed, interdependent power unit that could punish any weak link. And late war Germany couldn't consistently support that level of complexity. Skilled labor, quality materials, stable processes. Those are the invisible fuel of reliability and they were becoming scarce. That's the lost signature here. The HE-177 didn't fail for lack of ideas. It struggled because its complexity outran what the logistics system could realistically sustain. Junkers JU-188, JU-388. The JU-188 and JU-388 were what late war evolution looks like when engineers refuse to quit. Built on the bones of the JU-88, these were slicker, more refined machines. 
cleaner aerodynamics, better speed, and in the right configurations, a higher service ceiling that mattered when the fight moved upward. Depending on the variant, they were shaped for exactly what Germany needed most by then. High altitude reconnaissance, high altitude bombing, and night fighting. Rolls where a few extra miles per hour and a few thousand feet could mean the difference between getting home and not. But premium wartime aircraft come with premium upkeep. The higher-end variants often piled on specialized systems, sometimes pressurization by type, unique high-altitude equipment, and depending on mission, sensors and radar. And every one of those upgrades added failure points and increased man hours per flight hour. Then there was the parts reality. These late variants leaned on engines and components that were hot commodities in a collapsing economy. When your supply chain is breaking, factories hit, transport disrupted, quality uneven, you can't reliably feed a sophisticated aircraft. That's why they belong on this list. It wasn't that the design was bad, it's that the technology package and the spares burden stopped matching what a disintegrating industrial system could support. Horton, HO229, H.IX. The HO229 is one of those airplanes that still feels modern when you look at it today. A flying wing isn't just a styling choice, it's a promise. Less drag, fewer protrusions, and the potential for remarkable speed and efficiency if you can make the stability and control work. Pair that concept with jet power and you get what the Horton brothers were chasing, a true future jet, the kind of aircraft that made post-war engineers lean forward in their chairs and ask, wait, they were doing this in 1944? But the gap between a brilliant prototype and a combat aircraft is the ground truth, repeatability. The HO229 was still young. Its stability, control behavior, and production tolerances weren't fully locked in. That matters because maintenance depends on standardization. If two airframes aren't truly alike, you can't streamline repairs, you can't stock spares confidently, and you can't train mechanics to a predictable routine. Add wartime substitute materials and a highly unusual structure, and mass production becomes even harder to normalize. And then there's the invisible machinery of war. Training syllabi, manuals, depots, and supply chains. The HO229 didn't have the time to build any of it. That's the lost signature. It didn't lose because it couldn't fly. It lost because it couldn't grow up fast enough to become a maintainable, sustainable fighting system. Kyushu J7W1 Shinden. The J7W1 Shinden looked like Japan trying to bend the laws of convention to solve one urgent problem, the B-29. Its canard pusher layout, small four planes up front, the prop pushing from the rear, left a clean, open nose for serious firepower, and it aimed straight at interceptor priorities. Climb fast, get high, and hit hard where the bomber streams lived. In concept, it was a home defense specialist, optimized for the moment when minutes mattered more than elegance. But that same layout packed the project with hard problems. A pusher prop raises tricky questions about engine cooling, airflow management, vibration, and how the aircraft behaves across speeds and angles of attack. The landing gear layout and overall packaging also complicate maintenance access because when you rearrange the whole airplane, you rearrange how mechanics reach what breaks. Designs like this don't become dependable by luck. They become dependable through relentless flight testing and the slow grind of fixes. And late war Japan didn't have the luxury of that grind. Fuel was scarce. Materials were constrained. Test time those precious hours that reveal the bugs and let engineers debug them out, was running out. 
that's the lost signature. The Shinden wasn't short on vision. It was short on test hours. And without those hours, even the smartest interceptor stays unfinished in the only place that matters, the front line. Mikoyan Gurevich 1250 MiG-13. The I-250, later known as the MiG-13, was the Soviet Union taking a clever detour at exactly the moment turbojets were still young and temperamental. The idea was mixed power. Use a piston engine for most of the flight, then call on a separate boost system when you needed a burst of speed. In theory, it was the perfect transitional weapon. Keep the dependable old-world heartbeat of a prop-driven fighter, but add a new-world punch for the moments that mattered. A jet threat appears? You don't need a full-time jet. You need a fast answer. But the shortcut came with a maintenance bill that was bigger than it looked. A hybrid system is two worlds in one airframe. Piston routines and parts on one side, boost system procedures and support on the other. That doubles the training burden, complicates troubleshooting, and multiplies what you must stock and standardize. And if the boost system isn't consistently stable, the aircraft's headline advantage becomes something you can't bet your life on. Speed that only shows up when it feels like it isn't speed. It's a gamble. That's the lost signature. On paper, it's logical and even elegant. In the squadron, it asks a brutal question. Do you really have enough skilled mechanics, enough spares, and enough process discipline to keep a hybrid fighter honest day after day? Yokosuka MXY-7 Oka. The Oka was built around a single ruthless idea, terminal speed so high that, in the final moments of an attack run, speed itself acted like a kind of armor. It wasn't trying to be versatile. It wasn't trying to be survivable in the usual sense. It was engineered to do one job one time with maximum closing velocity. Because at that point in the war, Japan was looking for any way to punch through a defense that had become brutally efficient. And that's exactly where logistics tightened the leash. The Oka depended on a carrier aircraft to haul it to the release area, which meant the entire concept lived or died on the mothership's ability to reach that point. That required escort, successful penetration, and favorable conditions against layered air defenses. Three things that got harder, not easier, as the war closed. It was also a one-mission system, so it couldn't create durable, repeatable combat power the way a conventional fighter or bomber squadron could. By late war, every supporting link was strained. Fuel, available carrier aircraft, trained crews, and the planning and coordination needed to run the chain cleanly. The Oka didn't lose because it wasn't fast. It lost because the deployment chain was too easy to break. So that's the list. And if you felt the pattern, it isn't bad aircraft. It's brilliant machines that asked for a world the war couldn't provide. Clean fuel, perfect parts, trained hands, stable runways, and a supply system that could keep up with the speed of the ideas. Because in combat, raw performance is only half the story. The other half is uptime, what launches, lands, and launches again when nobody's watching. Now I want to hear where you land. Are you team engineering genius? The crowd that says a breakthrough is still a breakthrough, even if it arrives with problems. Or are you team logistics reality, the folks who believe the most dangerous weapon is the one you can keep running every day? Drop your pick in the comments and tell me what list you want next. <laughs>